to the polls for what has been described as the biggest single day election in the world. 205 million people are registered to vote in the process which will elect the president, members of parliament and holders of other positions across the country. This election is slightly unusual as old foes have turned friends and some of the ideological differences are blurred to a larger extent than before. We go to Anish to understand the who's who of Indonesia's polls. Anish, thanks so much for joining us. In this year of elections, Indonesia is one particularly important because of uh, its population, because of the role the country plays. It's one of the key countries in that region as well as even globally. So uh, while we talked about this before, could you maybe just run, uh, run through who are the major candidates? It's especially uh, interesting, maybe even a bit confusing because the nature of alliances in the country. Yes, as you said, uh, some of the alliances are quite interesting this time. Uh, because what we're looking at is, uh, you know, former uh, enemies and contenders being allies, strong allies right now uh, in this current election. Uh, the most, uh, the front runner candidate at this point, uh, compared to all opinion polls, uh, would be Prabowo Subianto, who has contested uh, against the current incumbent pre President Jokowi uh, in the past two elections and, you know, lost to him, obviously. And uh, he is standing this time uh, uh, with, with his running mate, who is uh, Joko Widodo's son, and uh, a joint ticket which actually has the president's uh, endorsement. So this sort of alliance is something that is quite uh, interesting to see. Uh, the, the other candidates that we have is Anis Biswadin, who pretty much has been always in the opposition. Uh, he uh, currently runs as an independent, uh, but uh, his backing actually has the same old uh, oppos uh, opposition Democratic Party and uh, the Nasdem Party Alliance. And uh, this is pretty much uh, the more right-wing alliance uh, among the three right now. And uh, then we have Ganja from the PDIP, which is which is the former uh, ruling party. Uh, if uh, Joko Widodo's uh, past two elections are to be considered, uh, he was part of the PDIP uh, group, and uh, which is led by Mekavati Sukarno Putri. And uh, right now, they are uh, no longer allies, but contenders in this election. And uh, in all of this, uh, what we're looking at is reworking of alliances, but most importantly, the coming back of you know strongmen. Uh, culture, dynastic culture, uh, which was something that since democratization uh, in the 90s, Indonesia had tried to avoid as much as possible. It's, it wasn't that it wasn't completely absent, obviously. Obviously, Megawati Sukarno Putri's presence uh, throughout uh, the entire phase since democratization is obviously uh, you know, part of the dynasty politics. But at the same time, what we are looking at was uh, issues were at the heart of uh, most of the election campaigns. Right now, issues may be big, uh, but like some of the most uh, important, crucial issues, like uh, the omnibus bill that uh, we talked about on this show, uh, which is uh, all, all, uh, what is called as a job creation bill, has always been a big matter of contention, especially for labor movements, uh, for environment, for uh, you know, for uh, any kind of protections that exists right now on uh, you know on in sectors like mining and uh, in sectors like telecommunication and so on which are quite crucial uh, which uh, which are currently uh, held by the state at this point in time so uh, bringing in foreign capital into such crucial sectors uh, allowing for extractivist uh, sort of uh, capital to enter these issues many of the bread and butter issues are not at the heart of the uh, debates right now, and that is really what sets us up, sets us apart from you know previous uh, elections we have seen recently in Indonesia, and and so you have a personality centric, dynasty centric kind of politics right now being played out, especially with these three major candidates, uh, who are the only candidates. Obviously, Indonesia's rules limit uh, the kind of candidature that can be filed uh, in the current system. So obviously. Uh, it has to be somebody who is uh, backed by one of the major parties. So definitely these three candidates are the only ones that we have. Nevertheless, uh, you have attempts by social movements to actually highlight some of these issues. Obviously, it is not really taken up by the mainstream media at this point in time. In that case, quickly, so what are some? What are the agenda of these candidates in terms of what are they uh, promising if, like you said, you know, many of these issues are not really uh, making it to the election campaign itself? 
Uh, right now, very interestingly, obviously, uh, Prabowo, who until recently has always been a major critic of uh, Joko Widodo, uh, has, uh, is now promising to continue most of his policies, maybe not some of the most contentious ones, including the, uh, the move to shift the capital away from Jakarta uh, to another new place. Uh, and this is something that has obviously had its own controversy at the time. Uh, and this primarily has to do with the manner in which climate change is affecting uh, the capital city. But uh, other than that, there is virtually no difference between the kind of policies and you know the promises that uh, Prabowo is making uh, with respect to what Joko Widodo has done so far. Um, on the other hand, this is uh, the policy differences between uh, say Prabowo and Ganjar is something that is quite Ganjar is the PDIP candidate is something that is almost virtually absent. Ganjar obviously gives us a sort of liberal flavor. Obviously, uh, PDIP has always been, uh, you know, pre has always presented itself as a moderate face and, you know, the face of uh, right-wing Islamist uh, presence in Indonesia. And so Ganjar kind of uh, gives that uh, kind of flavor, uh, but it doesn't really, it is not really setting himself apart. And it, the only one who is actually uh, you know, quite apart from these two uh, figures right now is Adios Beswadin, who has taken up some of the more populist issues, but uh, is uh, obviously being backed by, his alliance is backed by uh, several Islamist parties, uh, has to temper it with a significantly larger social conservatism that possibly even, uh, you know, Joko, uh, jo be it Jokowi or Prabowo or Ganjar could even fathom. So that is the kind of uh, agenda that they're running with. Uh, obviously, we have to remember that pretty much all of them, all their parties that we're looking at, uh, most of them pretty much supported all of Joko Widodo's uh, moves and policies, including the job creation bill, uh, including uh, any uh, the, the changes in the criminal code. All of that was very uh, widely supported within the, the parliament and all of these parties had given their complete endorsement. So it is not like the, the ruling elite at this point is virtually uh, indistinguishable in many respects, as, as, uh, apart from certain key issues of whether they're socially or you know, socially conservative or liberal. And that is pretty much the only thing that sets it apart. Even there, there is just a level of moderatism that is allowed. You do not really see much of, you know, social liberalism being there. And other than that, uh, most of them pretty much agree on most of the things that uh, that the Widodo uh, administration had passed. And that pretty much clearly shows how the situation is right now. And that is why we are seeing less issue-based politics and more personality-based politics at this point in time. And that is pretty much the uh, the poverty of the election campaign right now in Indonesia. Thank you so much, Anish, for that update. For our second story, we take a look at the health crisis faced by the people of Afghanistan. The crisis has been accentuated by a host of natural disasters and climate change, but it's also essential to see it in the context of the failure of the US and its allies to build anything meaningful in the sector during the 20-year-long invasion. We go to Anna to find out more about these issues. And thanks so much for joining us. Uh, of course, a very uh, grave situation that does not get the attention it definitely deserves. Uh, could you maybe take us to right now what are you know what is the situation like in Afghanistan as far as the health system is concerned, and what are the kind of conditions or circumstances that are aggravating the crisis? Well, in the case of Afghanistan, it's actually difficult to begin to find the right place to begin uh, because the country is facing such uh, such an extent of health crisis. Uh, ranging from uh, still tackling the polio uh, vaccination campaign, but also some of the consequences that are arising from uh, climate change and also from the earthquakes that we uh, that we uh, that the the people saw at the end of uh, 2023. Now, uh, all of these things have been um, put aside. Let's put it that way, about, uh, especially by by those looking uh, looking at Afghanistan from the west. Uh, and uh, essentially, there hasn't been enough uh, enough money coming in in order to actually support those programs. We do know that some of the international uh, institutions like the WHO, the World Health Organization, are still keeping Afghanistan in the focus. And they do know uh, that uh, addressing the health, health crisis there is very important. But uh, there's a question of how much uh, they, uh, they are able to raise on their own and how much of that money they're actually able to 
uh, to contribute to, to what's been going on. Now, one of the things that, of course, uh, has been talked about mostly is the situation when it comes to women's health, uh, women's and children's health, of course. Uh, and this is the part uh, of the health system that has been most affected since uh, since 2021, of course. Uh, we have seen a, a major, major decline in the availability of health care for women, uh, not only because there are no health workers or because the health services are not there, but also because women are having a more difficult time traveling to uh, to the health institutions, which are far away. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there are uh, limited limited numbers of women health workers still present in the system who are also uh, struggling with uh, with the new rules that that the, uh, the Taliban government has imposed on them. And, and of course, in this context, important to note that, uh, like you said, this is not a crisis that begins only in 2021 when the US and NATO forces leave. It's actually started way before that. And I guess part of it is also the question of how to build an effective uh, you know, health infrastructure, how to build a health system, which these, they clearly fail. So could you also take us to those que the question of different models, like what is the model right now of healthcare that is being provided in Afghanistan? How is that a legacy of these last 20 years? Well, unfortunately, it's a very bad legacy, as you said. So, uh, you know, when, uh, when we hear uh, people, policymakers, whoever from the US, from the West, uh, essentially from NATO countries, commenting on how healthcare in Afghanistan is looking, uh, it would seem like they did a major contribution while they were there. So, you know, uh, um, one of the things that did improve was, of course, uh, the indicator for maternal mortality. But what did not think, uh, essentially improve is the stability of the health system. Uh, and that's a major thing because. Uh, it essentially means that once the foreign donors disappear, the health system disappears as well. And also, of course, uh, it's not like the foreign donors were able to operate a perfect health system while they were there to begin with. Uh, instead, what we have seen uh, is the introduction of a scattered system instead of one which is uh, based on a, on a homogenous system of primary health care. Uh, there's loads of organizations who are contracted to provide uh, primary health care in different provinces. Uh, and of course, these organizations are doing the best. Most of them are doing their best. But uh, on the other hand, you know, it's not it's not a systematic intervention. It's not something that's based on a strategy and it's something that can very easily disappear. Uh, this is something that um, that we have seen essentially happening. So it's not like, you know, in, in 2021 um, when the funding stopped. Uh, it was not that these organizations were able to continue functioning seamlessly after after the change in government. Uh, on the contrary, they had major, major uh, problems with uh, securing that they could pay salaries or that they uh, could continue uh, continue doing what, what they're supposed to do. And now what we're seeing is that, you know, it, the situation hasn't changed much since. Uh, so there still isn't enough money for building uh, essentially a health system of uh, of a different sort in Afghanistan. Uh, and then on the other hand, it also seems that there's little wish to do so. And I'm not only talking about the local situation, I'm, I'm also talking about what's happening on the global scale. Uh, one of the most recent examples is, for example, UNICEF has taken over the contracting for the for the organizations providing primary health care. But they're still insisting on doing it inside this framework of universal health coverage, uh, which essentially does not respond to what the population needs. The population needs a health system which is based on uh, on what's, uh, what's observed locally uh, and on what can be built locally. Right, and also are there any models that are being experimented, talked about right now in the context of the current reality, which is that the Taliban is in control, there's no changing that. So what are the options ahead as far as the health system is concerned? Well, uh, there have been some recent uh, recent visit, visits on the ground, if we can say that, uh, international solidarity visits, especially uh, in December from uh, from RC, which is a, a, an organization from Indonesia. Uh, it's the same organization, interestingly, that uh, managed to build the Indonesian hospital in Gaza. And so uh, their delegation went to went to Herat, uh, uh, where the where their uh, October earthquake hit, uh, and what they observed on the ground is that there was essentially a what they said is that it's not like you see it on the news. So the people, while there is an obvious problem with uh, the food shortage, while there is an obvious problem with communicable disease, people are ready to, uh, you know, to to think about things that can be done. 
And because of that, the examples like building the Indonesian hospital in Gaza were quite well received. And these are some of the things that uh, might might happen or we might hope will will pick up uh, at least when we, we talk about the, the the local, the regional, the regional level. Thank you so much, Anna, for that update. That's all we have in today's Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.